My name's James Maskill. Um, today we're going to be talking about flat feet, um, something that's extremely common. Um, see it multiple times a day um, in the office and um, kind of affects a wide range of um, ages and um, so I thought it'd be a good topic. A little bit about myself. Um, I am practice here in the St. Joe area, just right off Niles Avenue here, um, do my surgeries in Water Valley, and um, I've been out for three years now. So uh, I, about my training, I've done, I went to Grand Valley for undergrad, um, and then did a little study abroad in Australia for about six months, and then went to Chicago Medical School um, where I got my uh, podiatric training and education and then did three years of residency out in California, San Francisco area and um, kind of something unique with um, a podiatrist, which I am, um, I did a year of foot and ankle fellowship with an orthopedic surgeon, um, Dr. Pomeroy out in Portland, Maine. So. Um, my brother, who I uh, practice with, uh, he's out here as well um, in Coloma. We, him and I are pretty much the only two podiatrists that have got a orthopedic, an, an actual official orthopedic foot and ankle fellowship. So, um, kind of gives us the best of both worlds. We can treat the podiatry conditions as well as the most complex foot and ankle stuff. So it's kind of a unique situation. Um, come from a family of uh, four other siblings, um, two of which are foot and ankle surgeons, which is kind of bizarre. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, my dad's a primary care physician who's just kind of retiring up in Grand Rapids, which I grew up. So I've kind of been around the medical field for most of my life, and or if all of it. Um, so I enjoy it and let's get started. Talk about some flat feet. So this is typically what walks into the office um, with a flat foot. Um, just some basic things that, um, you, that I look for that you can see up here. I'll kind of get out of the way. Um, you can see how their heels kind of their legs like this and then their heel comes out and goes to the side. Same thing on this side. And also I look at toes. You almost shouldn't be able to really see your toes that much. So people with flat feet, their, their feet go to the side, their heel goes to the side. And then here you can see that their arch is just collapsed. So that's kind of basically what almost everyone that walks into the office has some degree uh, that are complaining of a flat foot have a presentation similar to this. So what is the cause of flat feet? Well there's a, a, obviously a lot of things. Most common, um, you can be born with it, your parents can give you the genes of flat feet. Um, that's probably one of the most common. Um, you can have trauma. You can break your ankle um, or even your foot for that matter, which can lead to that. Um, you can have a laceration or a tendon rupture, which can lead to flat feet. Um, so that's pretty common. Um, in kids and even sometimes adults, um, they can get the, they can have this accessory bone, which is within one of the tendons, that's the main culprit. Um, so I see that a lot in you know, 13 to 18 year olds and really even sometimes adults that have gone their whole life with this little extra bone in their tendon, which about 20% of the population have, um, that can also be the cause of flat foot. Um, you can have a coalition. What that is is um, basically an abnormal connection which you're born with, again, it's abnormal, but it's actually fairly common in flat feet. 
um, where you're born with a connection between two bones and it's usually kind of near the ankle and that connection kind of tethers your foot to become flat and it doesn't move as well as maybe someone who doesn't have that connection. Again, typically I see that um, that becomes symptomatic in, in kids that are almost like done growing as far as their uh, growth plates. Um, that usually becomes kind of uh, symptomatic in them at that time. Um, and then I touched on congenital as well. So when babies are born, they typically have flat feet almost all the time. And in some cases, they have feet that are turned in the other way. But you can also have um, babies or be born with severe flat feet, uh, which can be problematic at a young age. So as far as today, um, I, I thought I'd tailor it more to the adult acquired flat foot. Um, it's also known as um, posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. Um, so the main culprit is the posterior tibial tendon. That tendon literally gets its name just based on its anatomy. It's posterior, which means behind the tibia, which is your leg bone, um, and then tendon. So that tendon course is right. This is a right, I like to use kind of props here, but this is a right foot. Okay, this is the outside of the ankle. This is the inside. That tendon courses right on the inside and then inserts onto this bone <coughs> called the navicular. And that tendon's job is to hold up the arch. The, pretty much plain and simple. It gives a little bit of flexion power but the main purpose of that tendon is to hold up the arch. Um, that accessory navicular, that's an extra little bone. It can vary in size. It can be as small as a pea, as big as a quarter sometimes. That's within the tendon. And it's, it basically, it forgot to decide as in utero or when um, things were the cells were deciding whether or not to become tendon or bone, it decided to become a bone within the tendon instead of becoming part of the navicular bone. So you find it very close to the navicular bone where that tendon, the posterior tibial tendon inserts. So this is a cadaver. This is not a live human being. Um, this right here is the posterior tibial tendon. So this is the inside of the ankle. That's your ankle bone that you can feel on the inside. That tendon literally courses right along the back, down, and then that navicular bone is right here. Um, this is your Achilles tendon, which I'll touch upon uh, later, as that's uh, also main um, issue and cause of the deformity as well. Um, but this is the culprit. This, this is the main tendon that leads to a flat foot when it decides to finally give out. So as far as um, how, wh what factors um, are predispose you to that tendon not working when you become an adult, it's usually the person who is born with a severe flat foot or their arch doesn't kind of pick up as you know they grow in you know late you know eight nine ten into their teens um, those people that are born with flat feet and just have them their entire life most commonly have that also that little extra bone is also very common um, that, uh, um, that lead to this posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. Let me go back one minute. That tendon, <clears throat> when it gets diseased, studies have shown that it just doesn't heal well. And so when what, what happens with flat feet, the tendon gets stressed because it's trying to hold up the arch, but your body and the way the bones are now then shifting, which I'll explain in a minute, 
cause stress and pull that tendon and then that tendon gets teeny micro tears. You don't necessarily feel it, but it just gives out, gives out, gives out and lengthens some. Well, then your body tries to heal it. Well, the problem is, is that that tendon, especially in the area right around the ankle right here, doesn't have a good blood supply. So your body doesn't heal it with good tendon. It fills in with scar, fibrous tissue, and just stuff that ultimately becomes painful, which ultimately weakens the tendon even further, and just it's kind of a progressive um, thing. So, sorry, females, it usually affects you more than men. Um, but again, there's, it's, it can affect um, anyone really. Um, and then typically mid-age, 40 years old. Um, and a lot of times when women get pregnant, a lot of times they can have laxity and they can develop a flat foot even after pregnancy or um, when that does happen, it can stress the tendon, which ultimately can lead to issues even after pregnancy. Um, but usually 40 years is kind of the standard, but I see flat feet from age eight to 80 or 90. Um, as long as you're active, if it's painful, you know, it's treatable. <clears throat> Back in the 80s, um, they came up with a classification which I really like because it's very simple. Stage one, two, three, four. Um, stage one is where you have pain, maybe inflammation within that tendon, but you do not have a deformity. So that's it. people have a normal foot and that's the tendon itself is just inflamed. Stage two is where it's you have pain usually along that tendon or maybe sometimes even on the outside of the ankle which I'll explain in a minute but the deformity is flexible now what I mean by that is you can take your foot and turn it side to side so in a flexible flat foot the patient may stand up and their foot's flat but you can take it and move it side to side so those patients can walk on uneven ground and usually not have an issue, okay? So I can take them in the exam room and literally recreate their arch just right there in the chair. <clears throat> Stage three is where it's fixed. And that means that it's become arthritic. So they've let it go for so long that their flexible flat foot, after years of pain and it doing that, all of a sudden becomes arthritic because the joints aren't meant for you to stand like this for 40 years. In that stage, the patient sits down in the chair and lifts up their foot and their foot's stuck and flat, meaning you can't move it really side to side, maybe a little bit, but the movement's gone. So in that stage, it's become arthritic. Stage four is where their ankle then gets involved. And that's not necessarily good because their foot's flat. The next joint to compensate for that would be the ankle. So the ankle's job is to go up and down, not side to side, but up and down. So when the foot's stuck and flat, and usually the patients that have had that for 10, 15 years ignore it, the next thing to go is their ankle, and then their ankle turns and becomes flat. So then those patients end up walking almost on their ankle bone. And that's a whole different, so then they get a flat foot reconstruction with a total ankle replacement. So it's a, just a big, that's a big deal. So four stages. So in stage two, this all this demonstrates is that people that are usually in stage two can go up and down on their toes. And what you look for is if their heel can turn in and out. So when that patient stands, their heel is usually off to the side. So this heel, if this heel were on the floor, it'd be off this way. But when he stands up, 
the heel turns back in. That lets you know that the joints are still able to go in and out and that the tendon probably still has some function left to it. So that would be stage two. <clears throat> stage three, he can't even stand up on his toes. If you ask him to pick up his left foot here, he couldn't even stand up on his toes if he tried on his own because the tendon's probably gone. Just doesn't even work anymore and it's become arthritic so the joints can't go in and out anymore. So when a patient comes into the office, what are some of the typical symptoms of a flat foot? Um, pretty much they say, I have pain in my ankle. And then you say, well, what side? They may say, I have pain on the inside of my ankle or the outside of your ankle, okay? Well, it's actually not the ankle that's sore. Because every, if you look at the, at the foot, what's kind of neat about it, but complex, is there's a lot of bones and they're all in one area. So if you put skin over this, it's, you've got multiple bones and areas and you think it's the ankle and it's not. So people say, I have pain at the inside, my ankle hurts. You get an x-ray of their ankle, it's fine. No arthritis, nothing. You look at their foot and it's flatter than a pancake. So. <laughs> Usually, pain on the inside of the ankle means they've got a flat foot. So what does that mean? Well, when they stand, okay, they stand with their foot like this. So if you look at it at the back, okay, this is normal. Their heel is right under their leg. That would be normal. In a flat patient with a flat foot, their, their heel's off to the side. So imagine the stress that puts on the inside of the ankle here if their foot's off to the side. So that tendon courses right on the inside of the ankle and when they stand throughout the day, they say, I've got, it's throbbing, aching, and maybe some sharp pain, could be all of the above, pain at the inside of my ankle and that's the tendon. So the tendon's being stressed. <clears throat> right there on the inside of the ankle. Now the outside is you've got two tendons called the perineal tendons that come down right in the back of the outside ankle bone, right here, okay? And in a normal structure, if you look at this, this space right here, this should be wide open, right? That's, that can actually fit those structures. In a patient with a flat foot, their ankle bone is sitting on their heel bone and they're pinching. So patients say, well, I have pain on the outside of my ankle and it's because all that, those structures on the outside are being pinched from how flat their foot is. Let's see, right here, you can see it. See the crease? So all those structures on the outside are being pinched. So patients may, may just say, well, I have pain only on the outside, and they may present like that. That leads me to know that their posterior tibial tendon's probably ruptured, and it's just gone, because that pain now is gone. So you say, did you have pain here five years ago, or three years ago? Yep, but now I don't. <laughs> so that means their, their tendon's probably gone. Um, pain on, with walking on uneven ground. So that would typically affect the patient that is arthritic, where their foot does not move side to side. Um, so you put them on a slant like this and they just have a very difficult time walking on uneven ground. <clears throat> Those are the main complaints. So what we've also known through um, pretty much just years of data is that this is a progressive disease. So you go typically from stage one, not always, to stage two, but then stage two go, can go to three, can go to four. So we try to stop whatever stage you come in at, the last thing I want is you go to the next stage because it gets more difficult and the outcomes may not be as good 
the higher stages you go. Um, it can also lead to a, that tendon being diseased or ruptured or whatever it is. It can also lead to not only arthritis of these joints, one, um, the talonavicular joint, this joint, the calcaneal cuboid joint, and this, what's called the joint under the ankle, the subtalar joint, those joints give you the in and out motion. But it can also lead to arthritis in the midfoot. So people say, well, I've got a flat foot and my ankle hurts, my arch hurts on the top. That's, that's all related. It's all just kind of progressive. And like we talked about, it can lead to ankle joint arthritis. So if your ankle starts tipping in, then you're in stage four and that's, you basically get arthritic very, very quickly. So this would be a stage four. So this is obviously trauma uh, induced, but maybe not the best x-ray. Um, this, so what you see right here is this angle. That should be parallel to this. So the ankle bone is tilted that way. That's from his flat foot. So this angle here should be parallel to this. So right here, this part of his ankle bone is up in his tibia at this point, and it's bone on bone. So that is a foot problem and an ankle problem. That's what, that's what you don't want to necessarily get to stage four, and so we stop it at stage three. <clears throat> this is a basic x-ray. Um, this would be a normal arch. You can see it right there. Um, specifically, you look at this bone right here. And this is kind of for me to do, but since we're here, we'll talk about it. But that bone you want off the floor to a certain degree. The other thing you look at is this ankle bone. And if you were to divide that in half, you want that to line up right down all those bones, which that does. So that tells me, okay, they have pretty much normal arch. Well, <clears throat> the, this bone over here on this patient is right here. So you can see they're walking on that bone. Not only that, but their ankle bone, it looks like it's pointing down. So if you bisect that, it's going down right into the floor, where it should be tilted up in it, parallel to that bone. So that's just some basic radiographs where um, you usually get them before you see the patient, and you say, well, they're probably here for their flat foot. Sometimes not, but usually when you see something like that, it's somewhat related to that. <clears throat> conservative options. Um, one thing I did leave off here, which is actually really important, which I'll talk about actually first, is stretching. So what I mentioned in the beginning, the Achilles tendon, the Achilles tendon um, is a tendon that's in the back of your leg and it comes down and it inserts right here on the back of the heel. <clears throat> and that tendon's job is to take your foot and go up and down. So the Achilles tendon is actually probably the biggest tendon in your body. It's one of the strongest tendons in your body. So the deforming force, when that thing gets tight, is very strong. And in patients with flat feet, it is almost always tight. In fact, I have yet to see someone with a flat foot that doesn't have a tight Achilles tendon. And the reason why is because of really just biomechanics. So it comes down and inserts on the back of the heel. But remember, patients that have flat feet, their heel is off to the side. So if their heel is off to the side and it's tight, it doesn't pull you straight up and down. What it does is it pulls you over more and up. 
So when, it, when that is the case, it stresses the inside of the ankle, causing more tears of the posterior tibial tendon, and it actually pinches on the outside because it's just getting worse and worse. So if you don't stretch your Achilles tendon, you have no hope <laughs> of conservative treatment. So that is just, I mean, it's basic things. It takes five minutes out of your day, and that is the biggest, that, that's the most important thing that you can do. So what goes along with that is usually in uh, orthotics. What orthotics are are just a cut, I mean, an insert. It can be something over the counter, um, or it can be a custom insert. So if you're stage two or three, something over the counter, it's got to be if it, iffy. Everything you see on TV doesn't work. It's a, it's a, you'll spend a lot of money because you buy an orthotic that's $25 and it, it, it's not enough support. There's a couple over-the-counter orthotics that you can get at certain store, like maybe a running store, or I just tell my patients to go on Amazon and type in, you know, what, a super feet or power step. Those are good for a flat foot, but eh, not necessarily awesome either. It's usually a custom insert, which can be expensive depending on insurance, but really stretching in orthotics are the two main things to get better conservatively. All the other things, bracing, that's for mainly stage four, sometimes stage three, um, for, but it's mainly the arthritic components. And remember, it's a foot thing. So if you put on a brace, a brace is usually goes around the ankle. So it's mainly for stage four. It doesn't help a, a flat foot that often. Um, so I don't use that a lot unless they have an ankle issue. Um, and then standard things, um, not, you know, NSAIDs like Motrin, Aleve, anything like that, plus or minus. <laughs> doesn't usually help a lot, but it can. Um, injections sometimes work, um, but again, you gotta be careful. If you get an injection, you just have to make sure it's not in the tendon. Because what I've seen a lot are patients that show up and say, I've had an injection, where did you have it? Well, I had it right here in my tendon, and then you get an MRI and their tendon ruptured. Because, yeah, the, the steroid can basically cause weakening of the tendon, and then they do something and it pops. So I never inject any tendon in the foot. You can inject the joint. So if there's actually enough space to get a little needle in there, you could do it. Um, and that's a viable option as well. In physical therapy, plus or minus. Um, it, if a patient like truly does not want surgery and they're like, nope, I will not have it, then I'll send them to physical therapy. But um, anecdotally, you know, my experience, it doesn't typically help the flat foot pain. Um, because again, the foot, it's, a, it's more of a biomechanical issue. It's, you know, they, they can do all their things and they'll feel better during their treatment the second they're done with physical therapy, the pain's right back. So that's, that's not the best option, but I've, I've used it before. It is an option. The two main things to do would be stretching and an orthotic. And I give it probably three to four months, and I tell the patient, you, by that time, you will know whether or not it's gonna work. You may not be pain free, but I say if you're getting better and you're heading on that course of, you know what, I'm doing better each month I look at it a little bit better, a little bit better, then you say, okay, let's try it for the next six months. If, they're, if they say I'm not any better, a little bit worse, they're probably not gonna get better with conservative treatment. <clears throat> So if that's the case, then it becomes a surgical issue. 
Um, and the surgery treatment completely depends on which stage <clears throat> they're in. Um, a lot of times you get, can get a CT scan um, if there's an arthritic component to look at the bones or an MRI or sometimes even both if it's a complicated uh, situation. And that's just for more or less surgical planning. Um, every patient, unless they've, they, they come in with a severely arthritic flat foot, ankle, um, and they've already tried, uh, most of those patients have tried inserts and stretch, you know, they've been through the whole rigmarole. Um, I'll do surgery on a meeting for the first time, but I, for the flat feet, I typically make the patient at least try it because if they can get better, that orthotic can, I mean, or stretching, or inserts, whatever it may be, it can help alleviate their pain for years. I mean, my, my wife's got horrible flat feet. I mean, pancake flat. And she's been in orthotics for 13 years, no pain. Um, and she, that's what she's done. She stretches occasionally. Um, but um, it's, it's worked thus far for her. So have to at least try something conservatively. <clears throat> So what are the surgical options? Um, in the, you go to a different podiatrist or orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon, they may have a different idea um, of what to do. Um, I, you kind of do what you're trained to do. Um, for stage two, I do what's called an all-American procedure. Um, the guy I trained with kind of uh, came up with uh, these combinations of procedures that have worked out, um, the studies show it, the outcomes are very good, the longevity of the reconstruction um, has come to find out that it may even last a lifetime or with very minimal um, complications. And um, it's, I'll go over some of the, the things that we do, but it's, it works pretty well for the stage two. And what it does is it gives you the ability to maintain the flexibility, the in and out motion. So <clears throat> the only time I will push a patient really to like say, eh, I think you should go the surgical route is if they are experiencing pain. So if they're in stage two, they've tried inserts and stretching and uh, medicate, you know, anti-inflammatories and everything else they've done. And they say, it's just still killing me, it's killing me. Well, there's one thing that lets you know you're going from one stage to the next and that's pain. So if that patient just continues to go on and on, remember it's progressive. At some point they're gonna hit stage three and they're gonna come back and I'm gonna say, well, we should have done it in stage two because now it has become arthritic and now I have to do a triple arthrodesis. So that's where you take the joints that go in and out and you actually, you take these three joints that I named earlier, talonavicular joint, calcaneal cuboid joint, and the joint below the ankle, the subtalar joint, you take them and you fuse them, but you fuse them and you reconstruct their arch at the same time. So that patient has difficulty walking on even ground. Well, they do to begin with. So really what you do is you just help alleviate the pain. They don't have much motion, so they don't lose a whole lot of motion. You just help take their pain away. Um, that's called a triple arthrodesis. And <clears throat> stage four, usually is a staged uh, procedure um, where you would do a triple arthrodesis and then put in a total ankle replacement. Patients don't do well when you fuse all those three joints and then fuse their ankle because it becomes so stiff it's almost just like a peg, I mean nothing moves in the foot anymore. So that can become painful uh, to patients and just, it's called a pan-tailor fusion and it just does not 
it's not the most, it's not like a home run. Sometimes you do it um, in, in certain cases, but um, I like to preserve some motion and that, that would be a total ankle replacement. So this is the state, so this is all American procedure. Um, and you kind of do a stepwise approach. The first thing you do is you actually go up into the leg, okay, and you lengthen one of the muscles, or if not both, um, uh, up in the leg to, to lengthen the Achilles tendon. Because remember, that's one of the issues that causes the deformity. So you have to lengthen that. And then <clears throat> you go to the heel and you cut the heel in half, shift it. So remember, when they stand, their heel's here. So you cut the heel in half, you shift it over, back under their leg, and then you put a couple screws to hold that position right there. Um, <clears throat> in addition, remember when you, the, in the very beginning I talked about when they stand, you can see their toes. Well, their foot, when they stand, is like off to the side like this, okay? So to get those toes back this way and help restore the arch, you have to put a cadaver bone, and that's right here, that little wedge, and right there, that little white bar, and you fix it with a screw. And that really helps restore the arch and swing the foot back around. So that's called a lateral column lengthening. Fancy term, but that's what you do. And then, last but not least, you have to address the actual problem why they came in is the posterior tibial tendon, right? So in that instance, if you get an MRI, it, it, the tendon's always diseased. It's supposed to be almost the size of a pencil, maybe a little bit bigger, and when you open them up, it's usually about the, I mean, it's the, it is thick and it's diseased or there's a knot in it. So if you leave that, you leave them with a source of pain and you can try and fix it and do it. I've seen it too many times where people try and fix the tendon, but the tendon's diseased and remember it doesn't heal that well by itself. So what I do is actually cut the tendon out and take another tendon that's right there that's uh, really not needed, thankfully, and I put it right into the bone. So anchor it right in, and that's right there. So you anchor it right back into the bone right here with a different tendon, and that's, that's the all-American procedure. So you can see when they stand, the ankle bone's right in line right there, and they've got a nice arch. So that's, that's for stage two. So you base, in that stage you preserve all the joints and the movement of all the joints. <clears throat> this would be a triple arthrodesis. So those joints right here, well let's actually back up. So the, the joints you fuse in a triple arthrodesis would be this one, that one, and then that one right there. So these two here and that one and on that view those two. So you just take those joints, you take all the cartilage that's remaining, a lot of times there's not a whole lot, drill the bone a whole bunch of times to trick your body that it's broken and fractured <clears throat> and then put screws across it, oops, let's not get there yet. <laughs> put screws across it to provide compression um, and let that fusion heal. And when it does, those patients are pretty happy because again, remember, they don't have movement to begin with and you take away, I'm not gonna say all the pain, but a lot of it. And they, those are, the, when they're in stage three and have pain every single day with every single step they take, for the most part, and you do that and they heal, they're pretty happy. That's stage three. Stage four, it, I mean, you can do a, a million different procedures. It's just all what's kind of needed. But 
Um, those are the, I, I do one of those at least once a week, once or twice a week probably.